Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Inshallah, we will begin shortly. Um, uh, Ustad Fadwa is not able to be here today, so I'm kind of doing this on my own solo. So just bear with me as I bring up all my slides and get everything ready, inshallah. All right, alhamdulillah. So uh, first of all, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, taslima al-kathira. If you're here for the first time, welcome. Alhamdulillah, we are, this is our second session, uh, Foundations of the Spiritual Path. Um, the recording did go out, so if you didn't, if you weren't here for last week, inshallah, you can watch the recording uh, when you're, uh, when, when it's convenient for you. Uh, but we'll continue the text, inshallah, where we left off. Um, before that, though, if you remember, I um, made mention last week that I was uh, trying to memorize the dua for studying, and I shared it with all of you. So I'll be reciting that for a brief moment, and then we'll begin the, the actual uh, text, inshallah. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatiha lima ughliqa wal-khatimi lima sabaqa nausul al-haqqi bil-haqqi al-hadi ila suratika al-mustaqim wa ala alihi haqqa qadrihi wa miqdarihi al-azim Allahumma aftah alayna futuh al-arifin wa wafiqna tawfiq al-salihin wa anfa'na Allahumma bil-Qur'an wa dhikri al-Hakim Allahumma alimna ma yinfa'na wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilman yuqarribuna minka bi rahmatika ya arhamu al-rahimin اللهم لا سحل إلى ما جعلته سحلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم وتجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم عذنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله آمين آمين وأجمعين الله أكسبت عن بهاف of everyone here الحمد لله um, so the text that we are reading from is Foundations. I'm going to also pull that up. Uh, hopefully you have your uh, PDF as well, inshallah. We can all read together. Um, just again, bear with me as I bring up. There it is. Alhamdulillah. Okay. So now, where did my Zoom screen go? <laughs> Too many screens. Wow. Um, okay. I lost my Zoom screen. It's hilarious. There you are. There I am. <laughs> All right, one moment, the screen share. So here we go. So just a quick review for those who are joining us maybe today for the first time. We mentioned last week uh, just some uh, biographical information about Sidi Ahmed Zaruk, who authored this text. Sheikh Hamza translated it. Um, and then we introduced it, uh, starting with just this section here. So. Uh, we read only a small part of it. This is actually a pretty lengthy text, uh, so I don't know how much we'll be able to get done in Ramadan. Um, we may possibly have to go beyond Ramadan, but inshallah, we'll do our best. So just a summary. Basically, the text is a roadmap for the seeker, for the person on the spiritual path, for the student of knowledge, for all of us to really be able to um, you know, clearly build upon a foundation. And so it's called Foundations of the Spiritual Path. And what he does is he introduces first the foundation, like what is required? What is the prerequisite of someone who actually is on this path? And he lists those uh, very at the very beginning. And then he works backwards um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, mentioning what would be required to get to, the, to these foundations. So we started off by... Um, explaining and just giving commentary on what these foundations are. So for example, uh, and again, I'll just quickly summarize them. We have the first one being taqwa, mindfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, privately and publicly, uh, and then adherence to the sunnah in both word and deed, indifference to whether others accept or reject one, uh, contentment with Allah in times of both hardship and ease, and then turning to Allah in prosperity and adversity. And so again, we point, I pointed this out last week, but there's there are conditionals here. You know, these are taqwa, of course, is a given. As Muslims, we all understand taqwa, but the conditionals that he provides are that it has to be consistent. You have to be a consistent person, right? You can't just have a persona um, and show up, 
you know, part time uh, as being a person who has taqwa because other people might be around you. Um, so he puts those uh, conditionals uh, actually on each each point here. There are conditionals, but the first one is that you are uh, you have that taqwa and you can maintain it even when you're by yourself. Um, and that's obviously a station to get to that level of awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It requires work, which is what we're going to uh, start to now explain um, the, the prerequisites to getting to even to these five. So there's that consistency factor. And then the same with the sunnah, right? Um, many of us, as, as I mentioned last week, we may be very well aware of you know, uh, aspects of the Prophet's lessons, life, certain teachings, because we've heard them, you know, we've heard them our whole lives, maybe our parents or relatives or from our teachers at, at the masjid or Islamic school, Sunday school. So we may know them, but knowing them is only part of it. It's the action that has to follow. So there has to also be, um, you know, it has to show that you uh, understand, you know, who the, the Prophet was, that he is uh, our exemplar, and you are doing your best to emulate him, and that would show obviously in your actions. Uh, so you're you're constantly trying to better yourself according to his way. Um, so the, you know, and everything. And this is where adapting, for example, the sunnas would obviously be the first point. Like, what were the sunnas of the Prophet? How did he begin his day? How did he? What are what are the different um, you know actions that he did throughout the day? Where did he spend his most of his time? And then what are the accompanying duas for those actions? Right, because obviously he was a human uh, like us, and so he he did many of the th same things that we do. But he also taught us how to do it best. Right. So when he uh, got dressed, for example, you know, starting his day, he 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 did so in the best manner. And so he's showing us uh, those steps, you know, how he started with his right and then his left, and then the dua of actually wearing clothes um, when he would enter or, or use the restroom, leave the restroom. There's all these beautiful duas that we should know, and we should certainly be able to almost imagine him um, as we're doing them, because that's what a guide is. It's someone that you try to, uh, to emulate and follow. So to that degree, we should be familiar with a sunnah and then obviously put that into action in our own practice. So the duas that we say should follow his uh, duas. And just to even teach our children that this is how we protect them, right? We're at a time of immense fitna, of immense fitna. And if we're not giving our children the best course, then all of these other deviation, deviated uh, paths will start to um, to take hold of them because you know we're 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 denying them, which is one of the rights of children, uh, the this this knowledge. So we have to be very mindful. But first, obviously, we need it for ourselves. So the sunnah is um, again we have to be consistent. And then the third point is also very important that once you uh, embark on this path to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, you don't concern yourself with the opinions of other people. And we have to also qualify that a little bit because we do have social responsibility. We have responsibilities to our family, our community. So this is not, you know, what we find today, which is, you know, I'm going to do me and I don't care how it affects other people. That's not what this is. This is a matter of your heart. This is a matter of not being compelled to action because you're trying to impress people or you're trying to avoid being ostracized. Because what that does is it it's 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 a it's an issue because the intention has to be for the sake of Allah. But when we start to, you know, factor in other people, then it's no longer purely for His sake. So learning how to do things truly because we want His pleasure, we want His rida with us, right? We want Him to uh, we want uh, to to be pure and sincere in our devotion to Him. But if we're also bringing in, you know, this group or that group or this teacher or that teacher uh, into our heart, then this would be a compromise of that pure intention. So that's why the indifference is, is again, we, we, you have to work on yourself because you have to really um, have those conversations with yourself. Like, why would I seek the approval of other people? You know, and that type of line of questioning, you'll, it's a, it's, it's a self-discovery process because maybe there's, you know, factors like, you know, if you, for example, um, are familiar with, you know, children who come from multi-sibling households, we know from research that some children, depending on where they fall in the order, 
may be susceptible to excessive people pleasing, right? Uh, so if you're a middle child, uh, you know, you may um, have what they call the middle child syndrome, which is you felt pretty neglected growing up because your parents' attention was uh, given so many, so much to the siblings before you and the siblings after you, but maybe so, you somehow got lost in the shuffle, which is a very lived and real experience, you know. And um, you know, I, I, as someone who comes from a household of five or five of us, I certainly felt that growing up. You know, I felt uh, I was, I'm fourth in line, but I do I do feel like I kind of had the uh, the um, the middle child uh, effect because I I felt it growing up. But recently, uh, Sheikh Hamza actually was speaking about hierarchies, you know, that hierarchies are real. And he brought that point to, to this, um, you know, to, to, to uh, or he brought that perspective that this is from Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually puts us in these systems and these family systems in order for us to, uh, to learn, right, that, that some he gives to some and he doesn't give to others. So it's, it's very intentional that we experience these things. Right. Um, so if you're aware of yourself and you know that that might be uh, something that you grapple with, then when you have this this introspection, this, you know, where you're asking yourself, like, why do I always seek people's validation? Then maybe you can arrive at, you know, at the same conclusion, which is I didn't maybe get that from my parents. Right. The nadara, And we've talked about this uh, or I've talked about this in previous talks, but, you know, um, Imam Ghazali and others reference uh, the potent eye of the mother and the father, but specifically the mother, that we as mothers have an immense power given to us, which is our attention, right? So children, we know they seek undivided attention, but mostly from their mother figure. So, or the, you know, that the main caretaker who's taking care of them. So when we are deprived of that, then we go looking for, as they say, love in all the wrong places, right? And so a lot of children who did not get the attention from their mothers may start to seek it elsewhere. And this is certainly relevant in today's uh, you know, uh, uh, state. I mean, look around and you see a lot of children who were not raised uh, by their, their parents. Um, in many cases, they're being raised by other people because of the way our societies are structured. You know, a lot of people are working out uh, or both now we have double income homes. And so the child get either has a nanny or maybe a daycare or a school drop off. So they get, um, you know, again lost. And now you're competing with not two, three, four, five, which would be maybe normal in a family, but you're competing with 30 students, right, uh, for attention from an adult, and uh, and that can really affect uh, the child's self, you know, image and view. So a lot of these things are very real human experiences, but. Once you start to pay attention to your own self and what drives your behavior, it can he help to heal some of those even past wounds. And, you know, there are many people who have unfortunately been deprived of that love that they, uh, that was their right. Uh, but subhanAllah, you know, the love of Allah can absolutely heal all of that. So that's what this process is. It's getting to that point of, I don't really need to worry about being accepted or rejected by other people because if I have Allah, I have enough, right? I have more than enough. I don't need human beings when I have uh, the creator. And so that that's really uh, what, what the point is here. And then contentment with Allah in times of both hardship and ease and turning to Allah in prosperity and adversity are, are similar in the sense that, again, you're consistent and you have the right understanding that that you have to um, not change your opinion of Allah based on your circumstances, right? That your fidelity, your loyalty, your love is true, pure, unconditional to your creator because you realize that all of your blessings um, are from him. And even if things aren't going well at certain points of your life, that doesn't mean that you turn from him, but that you know that there's wisdom. Because when you have trust uh, in, in you know, someone, or, or in this case, obviously, Allah, when you have trust in Allah, you don't doubt um, the, the reasons certain things have to ha happen the way they do. You, you know automatically that there is hikmah, but maybe that's something that you, are, you have to wait in order to learn or, or for it to be unveiled to you. But you don't doubt that it's actually there. You, you know that it must be 
khair because it's from Allah. So that's what, what is required for this path, that level of absolute, unconditional, unwavering trust in Allah, knowing that he always has your best interests and whatever his decree is for you is always better than anything you could have decreed for yourself with certainty, right? With yaqeen that you have um, that level of, of understanding. So alhamdulillah, I'm just going to, I think my, my screen um, share got bumped off, but we'll wait for, uh, alhamdulillah, I'm happy to see you. I think it's Ustada Fadwa. If you can please uh, re uh, give me back. Oh, there we go. You did it. Thank you. So I'll just go ahead and go back to the screen here. We're happy to have you here. Alhamdulillah. So we're just doing a quick summary and then we're going to jump into the lesson for today. So, um, you know, having that understanding, again, turning to Allah in both times of hardship and ease. And um, uh, I'm sorry, contentment with Allah in both uh, hardship and ease and turning to Allah in prosperity and adversity. So now the first is like your, your understanding of who Allah is. It's your aqidah, right? The second point is your, your protocol. Like, what do you do? What is your protocol for when you have hardship? Are you the person that uh, falls apart and goes, you know, completely into panic mode because you really um, don't have, you know, you're just worried and, and this fear overcomes you? Or is it uh, that you have that trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make things easy for you and you just patience, you know, you kind of, you've read the stories, you know about uh, these lessons that we've been given. So this is what's required. And alhamdulillah, that was, you know, last week's discussion mainly. So inshallah, we can um, if again, you're welcome if you're new, but you can go back and watch the recording to get more commentary on those five. For today, we're going to start with the building blocks, I guess you could say, of the foundations, right? Like what uh, what are the, pre, the, the first pre, uh, prerequisites for these five? So again, I love the, the way he structured uh, this, this whole uh, um, text, mashallah, it's beautiful. But the first one he says, mentions is, exalted aspirations. So basically, if you want to get to that level that we just described, this, this amazing the foundation, right, then you would need to have uh, high aspirations. You have to have high himma, right? You cannot be a person who's willing to uh, settle with medio mediocrity in yourself, uh, especially, right? Because, you know, sometimes, again, we get lost uh, in, in our own, you know, whatever we're, we're busy with, with our work, with our families. But when it comes to your work for the sake of Allah, you have to be a person who understands ihsan, itqan, right? Th that you perform with the best, that you, you strive for it. So it's not good enough for you if you, um, you know, and I'll give you an example. For example, <clears throat> There's times where, you know, I, I'm out and about and I come home and I'm rushing to come home because I have to pray, right? I wasn't able to do it outside, so I'm, I have to pray. Um, but, you know, it's kind of one of those situations. I don't know if you guys are like this, but I'm like this where uh, as soon as I get home, you know, because I'm, I've been out all day, I, uh, I end up, you know, wanting or it's, it's kind of like a biological thing. I don't know, but because I'm in my comfort zone, I also need to use, you know, the restroom. So now I'm like, Oh boy, you know, what do I do? Am I in, I'm in a, I'm in a situation, should I pray? Because, you know, I, I need to pray, obviously. I don't want the time to go out, but, um, you know, I also don't like that feeling, that anxiety of, I need to just rush through the prayer because I need to rush to the, to the restroom. So there's been many times where I have prayed because I'm afraid of, uh, delaying it or getting distracted and doing something else and then forgetting. But, my conscience then comes back and reminds me like you weren't really fully present in that prayer. You know, you were, you were very distracted. You were kind of rushing to get through because you needed to use the restroom. Is that, is that befitting for someone who is trying to better themselves? And so, you know, what, what happens next? Next I'll, I, I come out and I make will do, and I'll go right back to the prayer rug. It's happened many times before, but this is from this teaching, because if you accept mediocrity in yourself, then that's what the nafs will um, acclimate to because the nafs is, is lazy. The nafs does not want to put in effort. So when we take the, you know, the fast route, the, the easy path, it will always push us in that direction. But the challenge, mujahid al-nafs, is actually going against the nafs. And 
So I kind of, um, I don't know if I read this somewhere, if I heard a teacher mention this, but it clicked. It was whenever you have resolved to do something and because um, we know ourselves, even in the Quran, I don't know the specific ayah, but Allah says, you, basically, you know your own self, right? Um, so you have to know yourself. But if you ever get to a point of resolve on an action um, and you're not, you know, you, you have to kind of question it. You have to question the source of that resolve. And this is where knowing the khatir, right? The four uh, sources of our thoughts is very helpful because if you understand that all of our thoughts are going to emanate from four sources, then you can start to suspect what is um, a thought that you should follow and what's a thought that you shouldn't, right? So what are the four sources? We have khatir rabbani, Khatar Marakani, Khatar Nafsani, and Khatar Shaitani. And so obviously there's a split here. Two of them are good, always positive thoughts. Um, sometimes you might uh, want to do something, but all of a sudden you get this burst of inspiration and you're off, um, you know, instead of getting online and checking email, you're like, no, 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 I want to read Quran. Uh, that may be your, your angel, your angelic, uh, the angelic um, thoughts that come to you because we have angels that are with us, right? And they sometimes, you know, nudge us in, in good virtuous behavior. So it could be that. Um, istikhara or dreams uh, are attributed to, uh, rev you know, revelation that it's a source of revelation. So these could be considered uh, khatir uh, rabbani, right? Um, or just a, a really strong, uh, you know, conviction in something could be from Allah. Um, so those two are pretty obvious that they're good, but the, the, the latter two, which are those thoughts that we should be, sus you know, suspicious of, emanate from the nafs and shaitan. And in order to differentiate or discern what's what, you want to pay attention to habit because your nafs will, again, push you into things that are comfortable for you, that you've done probably before, whereas shaitan is, you know, he wants you to, he wants to ruin you. So he's going to compel you to do things worse than what you've done before. He'll push you in a further, like a, a worse direction. So in the sense of, in, in the case of, you know, uh, resolution, like when you, for example, um, decide to do something like, let's say you decide to, um, uh, you know, wake up for uh, tahajjud. Okay. So you have this resolve, you, you make the niyyah the night before I'm going to wake up for uh, tahajjud. Now, when you wake up and the alarm goes off and there's a thought and it's very, you know, the nafs is very crafty. Um, the nafs is very crafty. So it'll come up with all sorts of justifications. You know what? You're sick. You haven't slept for three, four days. You have a work meeting, you've got so much to do, it's okay, just go back to sleep and wake up in an hour when Fajr comes in or two hours, whatever the time is, right? It'll give you all of these excuses. And so that is a thought that you want to be sus uh, suspicious of because it's such a strong resolution, right? It's so like, um, it's it's you're kind of flooded with all of these uh, excuses all of a sudden, like where'd that come from? When before you had this beautiful intention, it's your nafs and shaitan may even, um, you know, inspire you uh, with something worse, you know, I don't know, uh, maybe you'll come and instead of praying to hajjid, you find yourself, oh, check your email real quickly. And then all of a sudden your email, you go down that rabbit's hole. And now you're on TikTok and you've been watching TikTok the entire time until Fajr comes in, right? So Iblis knows how to get us, our nafs knows how to get us. So the point is, when you have such strong conviction on an action where you already had a prior resolve, suspect it immediately. Be like, nope, that's nafs or shaitan. I have to force myself to do it. Don't even stick around for this back and forth, but immediately know that these two uh, evil forces that work against us 24 hours a day are at play, one or the other. And you have to be so aware of what's happening that you are you force yourself into action. The, the going back to that initial intention you had, right? That's how we overcome the nafs. That's how we elevate our uh, our our worship from mediocrity. Because mediocrity is just doing the bare minimum. Uh, you know, I'm just gonna do how I always have done it. But if you want to push beyond that, you have to learn to struggle against yourself, and that's what that looks like. It's suspecting the thoughts that we have, sourcing them, and then realizing that Allah inspired you when you had the beautiful intention. You know, that was inspiration or it was maybe your angelic 
uh, you know, um, you know, the, the presence uh, that, that was inspiring you, who are you going to listen to? It's a choice now because you had the Aenea the night before you set your alarm. What happened now? What happened now is you, you forgot that you have these two uh, forces, demonic and, and the nefs that are, um, that are going to do everything to thwart your initial Nia. So you have to fight them. And the way to fight them is action. Be true to your initial Nia. Don't uh, engage in, and as I said, um, you know, don't have a, back, a mental uh, back and forth. Just get up and do what you were going to do. So exalted aspiration, I mean, that's just uh, you know, one um, way of doing it, but it really is wanting uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wanting proximity to Allah, wanting um, wanting to uh, to be, you know, the highest, your greatest potential, wanting to really see who that person is. And that's why Ramadan is so special. You know, I had a, a halaqa last night with, with some teen girls. And so I made a reference, it was very outdated, but I just thought, let me throw it out there. Because sometimes, you know, these teens get into, um, you know, uh, what do they call it when, when it's, um, when uh, they go back and like watch, uh, watch things that are, that are from previous generations. I forgot that there's a, a term for it, but anyway, sometimes they'll watch things, right, from like the 70s or 60s or 80s, uh, and that's how ancient we appear to them, <laughs> but I referenced a movie that I watched maybe around, I think it was in the 90s. I saw it. I don't even remember the details of it, but the concept I remember, which was, you um, uh, sliding doors, you know, sliding doors for, with Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, I don't remember the movie, but just the idea of the movie was so cool, which was, you know, here's this woman and she, um, it's basically sh showing like a split screen almost of two different paths that her life took based on one decision. Um, so that's, it was a very cool concept at that time, right? So you get to see her she made this decision. This is the course her life took. And then she made this decision. And this is how her life went into a total different direction. So I always thought that was so neat. And what I've realized is that Ramadan in a way is kind of like that because we get to see ourselves in, in a light that we don't normally see ourselves, right? We get to actually pause the normal us, the, the 11 month of the year us, and have a new identity emerge, you know, uh, hopefully a better one. Um, and then the idea, I think, inshallah, is by the end of it, you have now a choice to make. You know, am I going to be um, this new improved version of me? Because Allah has given me ample time to really form good habits and just to become better and be more mindful. Am I going to be this person or am I going to go back, regress to the version of me that I had before this month? Because that's usually what happens, right? For many of us, we've definitely done that. Uh, may Allah forgive us. But that's where Ramadan is so amazing is that it gives us a, an opportunity to really um, have exalted aspirations. Why not? Why not uh, have high goals? And that doesn't mean you feel like a failure because you didn't um, maybe hit all of those you know, points on your checklist, to-do list or, or goal list. Don't feel like a failure, but be happy that you had the himma to even want to do those things. So if you wanted to go to the masjid every night of Ramadan for taraweeh, mashallah. If you wanted to, to do multiple khatams, mashallah. If you were like, oh, I'm going to memorize this many surahs this month, mashallah, or do this many salawat every day. That's amazing. Alhamdulillah. But we can't you know, lower the bar as, as you know, um, we find, unfortunately, in this culture, that's what they're, they're incentivizing or, 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 you know, that's kind of how they're conditioning people to just keep lowering the bar. So everything's kind of become lower. Our language is lower. You know, you do the bare minimum, you get uh, participation trophies for everything. Everybody gets rewarded regardless of their effort and merit. It's just, that's not our way. You work hard and you, you reap the rewards of your, your hard work. And you're, you know, grateful to Allah for the opportunity and for the gift of being able to do those things. But you have to have the aspirations to start with. So um, this is required, right? So having, again, um, high hema. And then the next is maintaining uh, Allah's reverence. Uh, again, so important in this day and age. I mean, always important, but certainly in a day where religion is, is attacked and even, you know, God's name, as they say, is taken in vain all the time and uh, in many cases even erased. Uh, entirely, right? People don't want to talk about Allah, even uh, within our community, but also outside of our community. We see, unfortunately, people sometimes becoming a little bit, you know, uh, constricted as soon as people start talking about 
religion and getting too, you know, um, too, too extreme or fundamentalist. Too. These are the kinds of words I've certainly heard uh, be used against me, you know, uh, describing me when I get into my, um, you know, desire to want to talk about Allah or praise Allah or reference Allah, because it's, it's necessary. We should be, we should be thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time, um, directly or indirectly, but he should certainly not be erased uh, and, and forgotten. How, how you know, uh, what kind of, uh, I mean, how, how is that a reflection of gratitude when your every experience on, you know, in life is due to the existence that he gave you, but then you can just uh, forget him. And of course, you know, we're human, we get distracted and distractions are external. They pull our attention away. Um, that's not uh, the same as someone who is willfully uh, denying uh, the, the remembrance of God or just not um, revering him as they should. And reverence to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks like, uh, you know, saying bismillah before you eat, um, saying mashallah, alhamdulillah, subhanallah, when things happen to us. You know, there are a lot of things that Allah shows us um, amazing signs, uh, and we should have awe of him. And that's why, um, you know, one of my, uh, why I love to teach children is because they just have it naturally, and you'll see it, whether it's your own children or other children, there's always this awe that they, um, when they're young, right, for everything, but they're, they're, they, they're teaching us of something that we once had that we've lost. So we have to now bring that back, and the way you do that is through the uh you know the, the the reflections you have right the thoughts that you carry and the words that you say so if you're you know for example um you know i i heard this story uh i think it was yeah it was sheikh abdul hakim murad just shared this beautiful story on his social media um and it's so amazing it was just such a powerful story but i'll share it with you he said that he met a, a woman who came to the masjid he'd never met her before and she said to him that she had only a hundred pounds to her in her account like that was all she had but when the earthquakes in turkey hit she was so moved by the plight of the victims that she gave half of her wealth of her savings 100 pounds as you can imagine is not very much at all to live by but she gave half of it away and she said that just a few hours later just a few hours later what happened 8,000 pounds was put into her account. Um, and it was from some loan, I think student loan that she had forgotten about years before. But a few hours later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deposited $8,000, just 80 times, right? Or actually, no, Fadwa, you have the math. You can do the math better. <laughs> uh, uh, between, uh, yeah, you can do the math for us, but let us know how many times more that he uh, rewarded her with, subhanAllah. So I just, thought that was so profound and the reaction to these types of stories you know some people I've, I've actually shared stories like this with people and some people are like oh wow that's that's neat <laughs> that's amazing or the, oh that's cool that's cool and they kind of like that's that's it and and you know that's they're they're not really impressed by these types of stories that we would see as obvious obvious signs you know um uh, from Allah that the, he's showing his uh, you know, uh, he his signs to us. So the believer doesn't just make it like, you know, respond that way. They actually um, respond with awe, subhanAllah. And then, you know, just allow yourself to feel the power of that, you know, that the story, like, what, wow, what, what did we just witness? What did we just hear? And, uh, you know, and then you can hopefully uh, sit with yourself and maybe think of experiences you've had similarly, but it, it allows for this process of just like, Allahu Akbar, Allah, Allah is so amazing. Um, and many times, you know, if you're paying attention anyway, you'll see these things if you're paying attention. But the reverence for Allah is all of these things. It's adab with Allah. It's knowing how to call on him by his most beautiful names. It's knowing how to um, speak of him, you know, as I said, and bring his remembrance into the conversations. Uh, we should never have... Um, meetings with people you know obviously professional meetings aside but like when we meet with our friends our family our community um there should be the intention whether it's uh, the host of, of the gathering or someone there someone at least should have the intention 
to uh, make the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you find yourself in a, in, a, in a gathering where there is no remembrance of Allah being made because everybody's talking about politics or uh, dunya and material wealth and uh, school and kids and all of that stuff, then it's on you if you have that awareness to somehow share something. Oh, let me share this wonderful story I heard or guess what happened or something. Or I read this Aya, or did you guys listen to the recent talk that so-and-so gave or whatever? Make mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that people um, don't fall into the habit of ever coming together and omitting him. That's, that's tragic if you think about it, that we come together and we don't even mention the name of our creator. So uh, that's, you know, reverence for Allah. Um, also for his book, you know, knowing, for example, not to um, speak over the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a very important um, adab that we should have when we hear the Quran being recited, that we know to quiet our, just immediately, uh, you know, go quiet. Or if you have to speak, whisper at least, lower your voice and teach your children. If the Quran is playing, the Quran is playing. Um, how do we carry the Quran, right? Um, how do we hold the Quran? All of that reflects your reverence. When I was, you know, I, I teach Quran, alhamdulillah, I used to teach young children, but we would spend a great deal of time on just uh, practicing carrying the mushaf uh, because, you know, it's not an average book. This is the greatest book. So they have to treat it like the greatest book and they should revere it. They should know to hold it with two hands. They should know to hold it above their waist. They should know to hold it in a state of wudu. All of these things should be taught. I've seen, unfortunately, many people, adults as well as children, running through the masjid or from you know Sunday school or whatever, and they completely lost this. They carry the Quran like it's you know another library book under their arm, or uh, sometimes all the billah hanging by their side, all the billah. So we have to have proper reverence for Allah and also teach this to our children and our and our families and obviously embody it ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always also said in the hadith um, Sahih in Al Bukhari, the Prophet said that Man ahabba liqa Allah ahabba Allah liqa ahu, wa man kariha liqa Allah kariha Allah liqa ahu, which is that the Prophet said, Whoever loves to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet him, and whoever hates to meet Allah, Allah hates to meet him. So the reverence and love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the, uh, you know, the, the, how it plays out. If you don't have it in you to want to uh, meet your Lord, to make mention of him, to, to just be in awe of him, then it will be reciprocated to you, Allah. And we obviously do not want that. So uh, that's a very important uh, point, again, uh, to, keep, to be mindful of. And then expending oneself in excellent service of others. So remember, what we're doing is we're, we've laid the foundation, right, of the path. Now we're helping um, to build upon uh, or, or to uh, put together what is required to get there. So these are the qualities that we have to have in order to get to those five. So uh, the third being um, service of others, khidma. Khidma is a beautiful, um, a beautiful um, you know, part of our deen that has also been lost you know, um, wanting for your brother or sister what you want for yourself. Uh, it really comes down to our values. And, and if you value um, the, the uh, rida of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than yourself, then it will be easy for you to give up your comforts for other people because you realize that the, the nafs, as, as I already mentioned, right, is not your friend. So to cater to it constantly is actually your own undoing. But to go against it, uh, will will elevate you. It's it's better for you, right? To go against your nafs. We we kind we we get so comfortable with comfort that we are opposed to discomfort. But sometimes discomfort is actually better for you because it pushes you outside of constantly being in that nafsi state. So doing something for someone else, right? Um, you know, there are many examples I can give you, but you know, just think about. Let's say you're home, you're, it's cozy, you just, uh, you know, the, the house is clean, everything's kind of, you know, we've all, alhamdulillah, inshallah, we've all had those days where we've just had a really nice day and things are going in, in the order that we want them to, and we just sit down, right? <laughs> we just sit down to, to, and we have our nice cup of chai and we're going to have our little piece of, you know, cake or cookies or whatever with treats we've uh, brought for ourselves. Maybe we're going to read a book. Maybe we're going to turn on uh, the TV and, and turn on something, uh, inshallah, beneficial. But we're just, we're now, it's all about us, right? Self-care, as they call it. 
And in that moment of, of just um, immense comfort, immense joy and ease, maybe you get a text message, right? And that text message is from a friend who's going through, she's distraught. She's going through something really difficult. Um, and you hear from this friend a lot, you're, you're in connect, contact with her. She, she Obviously you care about her, but oh, this is the worst timing, right? So you have choice to make. I could leave the messages unread. She wouldn't know that I saw them because we have all the preview screen and I know I use it all the time. I have to, right? So you, uh, you, know, you, you may uh, go back and, and use that feature on your phone to preview the message, but you're not gonna look at it because you don't want to let her know that you've seen the messages because you're just enjoying yourself too much. You can't give up your comfort, right? Now that's a choice you made. You're not certainly, you know, um, uh, compelled you to it. It certainly made sure that you did that because it wants you to not benefit from the rewards that Allah just pretty much dangled in front of you. Uh, because what's greater than removing the distress of a fellow believer, right? For and, and between those two choices, I mean, I hope it's obvious. Yes, you, you, we're deserving of ease, right? We're deserving of that sometimes, especially if we're not doing anything haram, and it's it's fine. But in that situation, when an opportunity comes to you to do something against your own nafs, this is when you're really understanding the way the world works. Because that temporary comfort you got from drinking your chai and watching your uh, rom-com or whatever other thing you may have indulged in um, uh, or read your book is nothing compared to the massive rewards you just got because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw he's witnessing your mujahid against yourself. He saw that you said, no, I want to put aside my own comfort because my friend needs me. And I know this would please Allah. So that, that it's, you know, we can't even fathom how many, how many rewards you would get. And Allah is so generous with us. So that, you know, expending oneself in excellent service. And so then the excellent service is also important to clarify here, because if you're going to do something with pure intention for Allah, you can't do it begrudgingly. You can't do it huffing and puffing and annoyed and, oh, uh, what, you know, what does she need now? And you're like griping as you're doing it. <laughs> And you know, these, we all have grown, inshallah, we've grown and we don't do those things anymore, but just think about Allah's witnessing you. So when you do it, you do it with excellence and with excellence, it is controlling any negative thought that comes. You certainly don't, you know, vocalize those things. Um, and you, you really make peace with whatever is being asked of you. And this is boundaries, you know, boundaries saying there's a lot of uh, ways this, uh, we can, uh, this conversation can go in, in terms of how to do things with Ihsan. But I would say create really healthy um, uh, boundaries around these things, especially if you're someone that's called on a lot. Like if you have family and friends and there's a lot of people that you end up having to do for then you need to take care of yourself. And by creating healthy boundaries, you'll get to a point where you don't do things, um, as I said, begrudgingly or uh, really with frustration uh, and there's resentment in your heart. We don't want that. We, we don't want to ever do things for others with resentment in our heart. And so that's where purifying the intention that it's for Allah, it's for the sake of Allah. And when we do things for the sake of Allah, it should always be done with uh, with immense um, with with you know happiness with joy with gratitude because Allah is giving you an opportunity to draw closer to Him. But this is you know where intentionality and it's a lot of hard work to get to that point. Um, but it's very important to be to desire to serve other people. Um, when you're in the uh, at the masjid, for example, you come in for an event. Maybe it's a premier speaker. Everybody's rushing to get to their seat, um, and you see someone you know, struggling or, or, you know, instead of worrying, oh, I'm going to miss out, I'm not going to get a front row seat. And you stopped to help someone because their bag was too heavy, or they were elderly, or they had maybe a physical, you know, disability. Allah is watching you. He sees that you had the need to do something, but you redirected yourself for the sake of someone else, for his sake. The rewards of that, again, we don't know, but you should be certain that it would be far better for you to do that than to just walk back past your brother or sister in need to serve your own nafs. So these are the kinds of ways that we 
pay attention to our intentions and we become better. Fulfilling one's resolves. This is very important as well because when we say something, we have to you know, act upon it. We can't be the type of person that, um, that just throws words out, right? Because, and I'm, I'm pulling out uh, from the content of character because right on the very first page, right? We are taught, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ آيَةُ الْمُنَافِقِ ثَلَاثَةُ إِذَا حَدَّثَ كَذَبَ وَإِذَا وَعَدَ أَخْلَفَ وَإِذَا تُؤْمِنَ خَانَ so this is in um, Al-Bukhari and Muslim. And the Prophet said the characteristics of a hypocrite are three. When he speaks, he lies. When he gives his word, he breaks it. And when he is given a trust, he is unfaithful. These are warnings for us that if you get in the habit of throwing out a lot of words, a lot of lip service, a lot of false promises, um, but you don't you know, fulfill them, this is dangerous for you. It's a sign of, of weakness, of spiritual weakness, because the believer, um, when you have an intention, you follow it through. When you promise something to your children or someone else, you follow it through, even if it's against yourself. And if you need a break, maybe you overshot. Maybe sometimes we, we want to do a lot out of our love, but you, um, you can't. Then you at least have the humility to admit that you know you you overplanned, you maybe um, didn't factor this or that, but you explain yourself and then you uh, you fulfill your your promise at maybe another time. But you absolutely don't just ignore it or trivialize it. Like yeah yeah yeah. So what I said it, I couldn't do it. Too bad. That's not the way that we should uh, behave as believers because it's you know to break um, someone's heart to not fulfill a promise uh, would inconvenience others. Um, in ways, you know, again, depending on the situation, that would really harm them potentially. And that now, you know, all, because of our own weakness, because of maybe laziness or just mismanagement of our schedule or time, we've now, uh, you know, affected another person negatively. So we have to take those things seriously. But just generally speaking, if you plan to do something or say you're going to do something, hold yourself accountable. That's what it is. Hold yourself accountable. Don't be a person whose word means nothing. And there are a lot of people, unfortunately, who um, who've just been broken because of people in their lives who give them false hope, false promises, but they never uh, come through. And it can be very, very um, you know, hurtful in the long run, especially. I mean, just think of children who's um, you know who are. I know children, for example, who are in different. Um, homes, you know, their parents have divorced. And many of the, the suffering of children of divorce are because of this specific situation. One parent uh, will be neglectful. They will promise, oh, I'm going to come into your basketball game. I'm going to come take you here. I'm going to take you shopping. I'm going to give you this. And then they end up not doing it. And then, of course, who has to pick up the pieces of that child, the parent that the child is with? Um, it's very sad how common that is, but this is what happens when you're not working on yourself spiritually. You you fall into these very nefsy states where you are your biggest priority, and you don't really care how your decisions or indecisions affect other people. So may Allah protect us from that. But just be a consistent person, be a person who uh, follows through. And then the last one is so important. I mean, all of these are important, but in terms of daily. Um, daily exercises, I would say this is so important, like on a daily basis, no matter what you're going through, this should be your state where you're always looking to magnify the blessings. You're always looking to, um, to, to count the blessings, right? Um, like recently I came from an event and I came home the whole drive. I was just in a constricted state because I had heard from so many people, just a lot of suffering, you know, uh, loss of, of children, multiple uh, different losses that have happened recently. Um, I saw people in these states weeping uncontrollably because of the loss of a child, you can imagine, right? And then, um, you know, divorce, um, being uh, dealing with infidelity, uh, dealing with uh, suicidal ideation, you know, parent who's, who's, who's taken their own life, 
and, and now the, ch the children who are also suffering with their own suicidal ideation. These are things that I heard all in one day. And I heard them in one day. And I came home. And as soon as I came home, I just, my Hamda family was there. And I just said, we all have to say alhamdulillah like all day. And I told my children, I said, please promise me when you make your sajda uh, that you really, really are in a state of gratitude to Allah because I don't think you realize, alhamdulillah, how much suffering a lot of people are going through that we're not going through. May Allah protect us. But that kind of hyper awareness of your blessings usually comes from this very intentional practice of you know magnifying your blessings, but also um, you know communing with other people, talking to other people, observing other people, um, and seeing that stuff, there are people, everybody's suffering in different ways. And like Ibn Abbas, you know, Radiallahu Anh taught us that um, there's immense you know benefits in tribulations, um, and this is how we we get perspective, right? He's uh, he's he says first that it could always be worse, right? Whatever you're going through could always be worse. And that's a, that's a factual statement. Um, any, you, you take anybody's suffering and whatever it is, as awful as it is, it could be worse, right? right? So that's a perspective we have to have. The second thing he says is that it's in your dunya and not your deen, right? Because a tribulation that affects like a material thing, a part of your life um, is different than something like a faith crisis. A faith crisis is real. That's that's a very scary uh, tribulation. So that's something to be grateful for, that it's just dunya, right? And then the third point is that the tribulation is in this life and not the next. These are things that give us perspective, right? That will hopefully then uh, put us in that state of gratitude to Allah. Like, alhamdulillah, thank you, Allah, for everything. Thank you for life, for existence. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for uh, my health. Thank you for my mental acuity. Thank you for my ability to communicate. Uh, thank you for my uh, ability to be mobile, right? I mean, just think of how many people are dealing with neurodegenerative uh, diseases or, or other uh, types of diseases where they cannot move. And they have full, um, you know, they're awake mentally, but they can't move. May Allah protect us from those states. Um, financially, alhamdulillah, if you have a fridge full and a pantry full, you're, we're living like kings and, and queens compared to people who don't even have potable, drinkable, drinkable water. They don't have these things. It's not a reality for them. Um, or, or food that's, you know, not, uh, uh, that, that um, can be preserved, right? They have to eat whatever they can because that's all, they don't have ways of preserving their food. So these are things that unless you're doing it, it will, um, you won't, you won't notice them. And then shaitan is right there to do the opposite of this, magnify your problems. So instead of magnifying your blessings, all you're doing is wallowing in self-pity over why did this have to happen and why this and why that? And I, you know, I deserve this. And we just get in these really awful states. So these are, you know, regular practices we should be doing all of these, right? Make sure our goals and our intentions are high. Don't shortchange yourself. Seek the akhirah, not dunya. Dunya is low. It's it's temporal. It doesn't last. Akhirah is forever. Be always mindful of Allah and have the best adab with your Lord, right? We have to have the best adab with Allah. We only speak about him in the best way possible. We have husna dhan with Allah. And uh, there's actually, let me, I pulled out a hadith on this particular topic. Um, where is it? SubhanAllah. Um, so there's a beautiful... Oh, here. This is actually one hadith, but there's something else I'll mention. So Abdullah ibn Masood, may Allah be pleased with him, said that by the one beside whom there is no God, a believing servant is not given anything better than good thoughts about Allah Almighty. By the one who besides whom there is no God, a servant does not improve his opinion of Allah Almighty, except that Allah will give him what he assumes. That is because all good is in his hands. So this is, of course, you know, uh, right? When we are grateful to Allah, we're revering him, we're exalting him. He increases us when we have the best op opinion, right? Uh, I will, he basically confirms what you think of him. Um, so this is what uh, Ibn Abbas, or I'm sorry, uh, Abdullah ibn Masood is calling us to. Um, and so I'm sorry, I'm looking at the time. So I, I, let's read this last paragraph. 
here um, before we pause for Q&A. So he whose aspirations are exalted is raised in rank. Um, Allah mentions, or I'm sorry, Allah maintains the respect of he who preserves his reverence. Um, he whose service is for others is ennobled by it. Beautiful the perspective, right? We are the beneficiaries of the service we give. It's not the opposite, because you think of service as like, oh, I'm serving people, but we benefit, we're ennobled by the, by the khidmah that we do. He who does that which he resolves to do is assured continual guidance. So if you're a person of your word, you will be continuously guided by Allah. He who deems blessings to be great by his own eye has shown gratitude, and he who is grateful ensures an increase in blessings from the giver of gifts according to the promise of the truthful one. SubhanAllah, it's just so succinct, so beautiful, so powerful. But on this point of um, he who's, uh, I'm sorry, Allah maintains the respect of he who preserves his reverence. This is also, I just wanted to quickly mention, because there are a lot of people who seek status, who seek, as we said in the beginning, acceptance by people who want to be respected, who want people, whether it's in their family, in their professional life, in their community, to look upon them with reverence, right, with respect. But they forget that that is something that Allah rewards to his believers or to his servants, right? And so it's not, you can't just get it. Because how many professional people, how many people of, um, you know, who, who you think it, they would, uh, it would, they're warranted, it's warranted that they would have that respect, don't get respect. Um, because Allah, you know, doesn't will that for them. So it's not something you can get from a worldly uh, place. Uh, that type of reverence that people seek um, is through Allah. So if you're not going to revere the one who gives you that place and status amongst his uh, creation, then you you clearly don't understand how things work. Uh, so just wanted to mention that. But alhamdulillah, we can pause and I'm happy to stay for an additional uh, however many minutes to go over the questions. So Bismillah. So the Fadu, are you here? Uh, uh, yes, Jazakallah khair. Thank you for another wonderful class, mashallah. Yeah. I'm going to go to the Q&A where I've asked everyone to please um, direct your questions to the Q&A box so that we can keep track of questions asked during the session. The first question um, is asking for um, the dua that you started the class with. And um, I think that you had said that that was available on the Zaytuna website. Is that true? Yeah, so I'm sorry, because I had mentioned that I do, um, I have a, P, uh, not a PDF, it's an image of the of the dua. Um, and so the way that I found it, let me see, I'll just quickly do it while you're talking and you, you're reading the other questions. So we, we save time. So let me go ahead and find it for you. Because it's Perfect. a link. All right, thank you. The mm -hmm. second says, I often find that what people say to me really affects my mood. If it's something good about me or my work, I find myself extremely motivated and cheerful. But when I don't receive this kind of recognition, I start to feel low and think negatively of myself. My question is, how can the how can the one that suffers from low self-esteem and low self-confidence find ways to build it up instead of being dependent on what people tell them about themselves? MashaAllah. So th I'm really glad uh, this uh, sister uh, asked this question because I think a lot of people would probably uh, fall in, in the same category, right? We, we are very affected. We do source uh, external validation because of all the things I mentioned, maybe other things, you know, there's, uh, you know, temperaments um, and, and different uh, personality types. They seek, you know, these things out more. So being, I think, more self-aware of yourself, and I'm glad that you have this awareness that this is what's going on, um, well, is the starting point to changing. Uh, but also, I think I'm just going to throw it out there because I feel like this is also a factor. If you don't have good suhba, right, if you don't have good people who reflect goodness to you, um, right, al-mu'min al-mir'atul mu'min, the believer is a mirror for the believer. So, when you have really good people around you, they will know how to uplift you, but do it in the right way. Because throwing like flattery is, is looked down upon because it's empty. There's no substance to it. But when you have God fearing good company who really wants your good, right? People who are good people who genuinely want to um, for you to be successful, then they will uplift you in a way where it doesn't um, feed into maybe what has been going on, right? Which is there's this um, 
maybe insecurity that you're dealing with that 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 those other compliments are kind of feeding into but really um righteous people will always remind you that your blessings are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and help you to redirect um even your own need for validation back to Allah because it's it's kind of just habit right if you start to um take some of the um the attribution of your your blessings this would be uh, something to work on because nothing nothing no good that we do is self-made nothing so all of it should be redirected to Allah that's why when someone gives you a compliment your mind you should be like you know they're being nice it's social it's it's a pro it's like an etiquette you know you just want to say something nice to someone but the reality, the haqiqa, the what's really happening is they are witnessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who's blessed me with skills, with gifts, with abilities, um, and the uh, you know the, the life force to actually do these things. So they're what they're witnessing is Allah working through me. So alhamdulillah wa shukrulillah, right? It's all back to Allah. And if you can start to do that regularly, then the words are not going to impact you anymore because guess what? Whether they say it or not, it's true. Whether people give you the compliment or not, it is true. And if, if uh, you're witnessing it, because, you know, if you produce something amazing, you don't need other people to come and tell you it's amazing. You know it. Inshallah, you should. And that's where confidence building is also important. Recognizing the ni'mah, recognizing that you are, you, you're skilled at something is a good thing to do because you're recognizing that it's Allah who made, who made that happen. But my point is, is whether people give you compliments or not, no longer is, is important because it doesn't take away from the reality of what's happening, which is indeed Allahu Akbar. Indeed, al Alhamdulillah, Allah is deserving of all praise. Um, so I hope that's clear. Thank you. Um, our last question says, can you please give some advice for improving one say do ratio at work? I work in a corporate environment and it can be extremely draining. Sometimes I fall short in delivering and unfortunately it's starting to impact my performance. I work to support my family. How can I take the spiritual route for improving my state of affairs? MashaAllah. Um, again, that's a, that's a very good and relevant question because you know a lot of people are struggling with the life home life balance. And yes, we become overly ambitious with our careers. And so we want to do a lot. But I think, you know, having um, in, in every business or every, um, you know, environment is different. I don't know what the company that you work at, but if you have uh, people who are there to kind of help shape like your, your goals, you know, your trajectory at the company, like what your long-term objectives or goals are, what your short-term goals are, then maybe instead of leaving it to yourself, because sometimes if it's like, there's um, sort of either insecurity or a feeling of, uh, what do they call it, um, imposter syndrome. There's a lot of these things that can affect our sense of self. Those things drive us to take on more than we can chew, right? Because it's like, oh, I got to show up. I got to impress people. And so there's a lot of insecurity driving that. But when you become more intentional and actually organized and plan like have like a, a plan for your year, like, okay, so in my current capacity, this is where I'm at, but this is my target for the year or target for six months or target for three months. And then you're working with maybe a coach or like HR or whoever would be in your, in your company, helping you to your supervisor, maybe shape how that's going to materialize. Then you're working, at, you know, in, in a very um, like it, it, that is a much more structured way of goal setting as opposed to letting the fear of maybe not doing enough and being, you know, uh, I know there's people who are now very insecure in their in their positions because there's so many layoffs happening. So a lot of people are just in panic mode trying to do more. But I think planning is always going to yield better results and planning with someone who's a little ahead of you in your role um, to be realistic because they may offer great advice to you that says, hey, don't do that because I made that same mistake and this is what happened to me. So asking for help, you know, and this is actually part of leadership. Um, if you look at the different qualities of like leaders is knowing when to ask for guidance and help from people. It doesn't mean that you don't, you know, that, that it's, it's somehow a negative quality. It's actually very intelligent to do that, to seek out your supervisors or people ahead of you and just say, 
you know, can you help me kind of put together some real practical, realistic, long-term and short-term goals for my uh, work so that I can uh, be balanced and not take on more. And inshallah, bismillah. And always, of course, start with bismillah. May Allah give you tawfiq, inshallah. Thank you, Ustada Hosai. Um, you mentioned earlier in the class about the recording. Uh, is, uh, are we ready to share just? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, inshallah, yeah. You can always share the recordings unless something really wild happens on these sessions. I don't have a problem with the recordings uh, being shared. Yeah. All right. I'll put it in the chat. I just created a shortcut for this week. Um, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> and uh, and then inshallah, um, I'll post this one soon. Be patient. <laughs> we have a lot going on these days. Alhamdulillah. 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 Jazakallah khair. And thank you. So if there are uh, no other questions, we're only doing Q&A box, right? So uh, yeah, I, I, checked the, I checked the chat as well. Uh, alhamdulillah, there are no other questions. And uh, inshallah, you can end with the closing dua. Sure. Just one last thing. Did you check the math on Sister Luna's um, math here? Is that correct? Because remember, 80, 50... 80, time, 80 times 100 is... <laughs> 8,000. Right. I said that. I initially gap, said. <laughs> your, the percent increase is a 7,900% increase. So, <laughs> mashallah, we'll just think grander of Allah. Mashallah. Sada Fadwa is a math whiz. So, that's why I refer, defer to her for all your math questions, which is like, okay, thank you so much to everyone. Thank you all for being here. And I look forward to our next session next week. And feel free to read ahead. And if you have any questions based on your reading, please uh, provide them, you know, come, come, uh, or uh, send them to Sada Fadwa. And maybe we can look over those before we start. So, with that said, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا عصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شهد من لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزة يا ما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair. And thank you again, everyone. I wish you a beautiful uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. And please remember us uh, if you haven't made a thar um, at, at a thar time, inshallah. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.